Oh, uh, yep. Okay, um, so just be aware that uh, we are recording and the recording will be sent out to all uh, participants um, when you signed up earlier. So um, I would just ask that, uh, yeah, people be aware of that. And if you're, you're not comfortable having your name potentially appear on that, uh, you um, may have to leave the meeting, but um, yeah, I think that should be fairly uh, straight ahead. Um, and so with that said, uh, I'd like to uh, begin. I wanna first thank everyone for um, attending. Um, and uh, I just wanna welcome people to our discussion about privatization and the threat to uh, public health care. Um, so I'm Chris Parsons, I go by he, him. Uh, pronouns, and I'm the Provincial Coordinator for the Nova Scotia Health Coalition, and I'm going to be serving as sort of a, a host and facilitator for tonight's event. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here, including our participants, but also uh, the very large crowd of folks who have signed up. I think there's a real desire for more sort of in-depth conversations about healthcare in the province, and hopefully we can do that tonight. Um, so we will be recording, as we mentioned, uh, and tonight's event is co-hosted by the Council of Canadians, uh, including its four chapters in Nova Scotia, the South Shore, HRM, North Shore, and Cape Breton West chapters. Um, the uh, Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives in Nova Scotia and the Nova Scotia Health Coalition. So tonight's meeting is happening digitally, uh, but most of our speakers and audience are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, and I understand uh, Monica, however, is currently in what is now Ottawa, which is built on the unceded Algonquin Ashinaabe territory. And we want to acknowledge uh, we are here on this land in Nova Scotia as a result of the treaties of peace and friendship, uh, the first of which was signed between the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy people and the British Crown in 1926. Uh, these treaties did not surrender the land or resources in this region to the British Empire, but instead set out the rules uh, for what was to be an ongoing relationship between the nations. Um, I also want us to keep in mind two things when we discuss healthcare in this context. Uh, first is a, a failure by settlers to meet our treaty obligations has led to disastrous outcomes uh, for the Indigenous people of this region. Uh, we recognize that tonight's discussion does not substantively engage with the complex relationship between uh, public health care and Indigenous peoples in Canada. Uh, we do hope to discuss issues of colonialism and race sort of throughout today's conversation, and we hope to address the issues surrounding public policy and First Nations health care, uh, both on and off reserve in a future, a future event. Um, it's, it's a very large subject and it's sort of difficult sometimes to, to attach it onto it. Um, the second thing I do wanna acknowledge is sort of the collective wealth that makes the social programs we have like healthcare possible and the individual wealth which makes private healthcare profitable are predicated on the historic and ongoing dispossession of indigenous peoples uh, in what is now called Canada. Um, as well as the ongoing extraction of wealth and resources from the Indigenous peoples in, uh, throughout the world, including the Global South, often by Canadian corporations. So the political economy of healthcare cannot be understood without incorporating issues of colonialism and imperialism. And I think that when we do something like a land acknowledgement, we should acknowledge what that actually means in terms of the things that we both take for granted, but also the issues that we're talking about today. So with that said, um, an explanation of how tonight will go um, is that tonight's discussion will be focused on the question of privatization and its impact on public health care and the health of Nova Scotians. Um, we've structured it fairly loosely as a discussion between what I consider to be three of Nova Scotia's best experts on uh, health care and public policy and facilitated by me, uh, not one of those experts. Um, and we are looking for questions from the audience. Um, and we've already received some via email, but as the night goes on, we do ask you to type them into the chat. Uh, Angela Giles from Council of Canadians will be compiling them in a document um, that I'll be monitoring regularly. And I will try to ask as many of them as possible throughout the discussion, um, but there will be no sort of open mic style question period um, at the end. We will make sure that as uh, many questions that get asked as possible uh, can be incorporated into the conversation both at the end, but also sort of as we go. Um, in addition to sort of uh, the ability to ask questions, um, or seek clarification uh, using the chat function. We also um, are going to be trying to use polling sort of throughout the conversation to allow people to sort of um, provide some feedback and participate a bit. So I think Angela was gonna uh, bring up a uh, example of uh, the first poll so people can sort of practice. So uh, you can feel free to sort of vote on this and we're gonna try to use this to allow people to participate a bit and we'll just leave it up for a couple of minutes. So if people wanna try using the voting feature, I see some people going, it's kind of exciting once it's up on screen, I'm, I can get to watch it live. 
Um, so we'll just run that for uh, maybe 15 seconds or so. Yeah. All right, we're at 75% participation there, which I think 79%, which puts us well above the average election for any level of government in this country. So um, the, uh, I'm sharing the results there now. People should be able to see that now. So we was 43% of participants are uh, here because they are concerned and active in the fight against privatization. 16% of people said that they're sort of generally concerned with access. 28% uh, say they want to learn more. Um, seven uh, people, 12% say they're a concerned healthcare worker. And I'm sure some concerned healthcare workers might have identified in some of the other categories. And there is one person who uh, stands as other. Um, who has other reasons for being here. Um, and uh, hopefully we can address sort of the concerns of everyone uh, who, uh, who's, who's coming here both as a participant and a viewer. Um, so we do have three speakers today. The first, uh, um, and I'll just sort of introduce them first initially. And the first we do have is Mary Jane Hampton who brings more than 25 years of experience in the healthcare, in healthcare system leadership as a uh, manager, policymaker, advocate, and consultant. She began her career in Winnipeg at the Manitoba Health Organizations. She moved, uh, moving to Ontario to become the executive director of the District Health Council. In 1991, she was recruited to Nova Scotia to establish the Provincial Health Council. And she later served as the province's commissioner for health reform uh, to serve as the principal architect of Nova Scotia's healthcare blueprint for restructuring. Since leaving government, MJ has led a healthcare consulting firm and has been a newspaper columnist and has written children's books, uh, two of them. Uh, MJ is also well known as a as the health consultant rather for CBC's information morning in Nova Scotia. So if you listen to the radio in the morning, I'm sure you may recognize her voice. Um, and then second, we have uh, Dr. Christine Sonier, um, who is the director of the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives in Nova Scotia. Uh, she has a doctorate in political science from York University, and she leads the living wage calculation for communities across Atlantic Canada. It serves as co-author of the annual Child and Family Poverty Report Cards for Nova Scotia. She's written extensively on a range of other public policy issues, including childcare, and serves on the steering committee of Child Care Now Nova Scotia. She also served for a number of years, 10 years actually, on the board of the Nova Scotia Health Coalition. Um, and then finally, we're joined by Dr. Monica Dutt, uh, a former chair and board member of Canadian Doctors for Medicare. She is currently the Medical Officer of Health for the Central and Western regions of Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, and she's a family physician at the Ally Center of Cape Breton. And she's an active member of the, the Decent Work and Health Network amongst many other organizations. So we're lucky to have all three of them. Um, and so what we're gonna talk about today is privatization. And I guess I'm gonna start by just um, pointing to the fact that Canadians often pride ourselves on the pu our public health care system. We often contrast it with the dysfunctional, unequal uh, and profit-driven healthcare system directly south uh, of our border. Um, however, the constant comparisons to the United States sometimes prevent us from examining our own system and its own structure, its own compromises and its own shortcomings, as well as its own strengths. Uh, indeed, much of our system is already privatized and many necessary services are available only through private insurance or paying out of pocket. Those parts of our system which are public, namely hospitals and doctor visits, have come under increasing threat of privatization over recent years. With the growth of for-profit clinics, reliance on privatized infrastructure schemes to build hospitals, and court challenges to laws that were designed to prevent practices like double billing. New emerging forms of healthcare like virtual care are exciting expansions of the way that we receive care, but they're also targets for speculators and investors looking to find new sources of profit and grounds for debate about whether they, how they should be delivered, um, how they should be paid for. At the same time, there's uh, exciting talk of private, uh, of there's exciting talk rather of taking private services like dental care and pharma care and bringing them into the public system. But what constitutes privatization? What is the impact on the quality of care we receive uh, through privatization or through public delivery? In what ways does it impact the care that patients receive? How does it fit into wider questions about what constitutes a humane and just society? So we've asked Monica, Mary Jane, and Christine to discuss these issues with us. And I wanna start by asking Monica um, about the same thing that we've discussed for much of the last two years. Um, so Monica, uh, COVID-19 has shown both sort of the incredible importance of the public healthcare system uh, but it's also created massive obstacles to accessing that system. Uh, it seems like there's been a, a rising calls uh, for, from some people to introduce privatization, and it's undeniable that many opportunistic investors and speculators see this crisis, like any other crisis, as a chance to turn a profit. 
but it's also made clear just how much health is a collective issue, not an individual one. So what do you think the COVID-19 pandemic tells us about public health care? And do you think that uh, it, it has made privatization uh, more of a threat? Hey, can you hear me okay? Yep. Hi. Thanks, Chris, and thanks everyone who is putting on this event and, and for having me. So my experience over the last two years has been in two different main capacities, both as a, as a family physician in Cape Breton. I work at a, a clinic called the Ally Center where you know, our, our patients, our clients tend to have a lot of um, social, economic and other, other challenges that they're dealing with. And I also worked as a medical officer of health, both in Nova Scotia and in Newfoundland and Labrador. So kind of saw in a big picture um, pandemic response. And I think, you know, what was, it was clear long before and is even clearer now is how challenging it is to be even close to healthy when we lack the economic and social infrastructures needed to keep people healthy. So whether that was, you know, adequate housing, whether it was for isolating when you have COVID-19 or just in general, whether people had paid sick days, you know, Nova Scotia had a, you know, inadequate uh, temporary program that is now finished. Uh, whether it's lack of immigration status, all of these contributed to the fact that some people were more at risk than others, and some people had far less access to start with to, to healthcare, and that was made worse. I do feel like I do need to comment on public health, which is kind of part of our, our health authority system, which uh, in the past at least had about 2% of our, our healthcare budget, and I don't know if that has increased um, but public health is often a key part of trying to keep everybody healthy, which is a good thing for our, our healthcare system. Um, I think just in, in lines with the, the theme of, of the night, I think, you know, challenges that, that came up were, you know, lack of access to care in general, given, you know, some of the, the stresses that have been on the, the healthcare system from you know, people who have COVID-19 or, you know, different infection control practices that were in place with perhaps clinicians not seeing people in person. And so there were, there were a range of, of challenges that came up. Um, I think just to say though, I think the challenges that came up were not necessarily because of us having a, a single payer healthcare system. And I think that the solutions we can come to to deal with challenges that we've seen in the pandemic and, and before the pandemic also lie within our single payer public health care system. And I think just last thing to say is that there were also many good things. I always hesitate when I say there's good things in the pandemic, but there were benefits to having a, a publicly funded health care system. Um, with the pandemic in many ways when we could do things like, you know, coordinate across an entire province, have, a, have the ability to collect data across an entire province, have the ability to um, allocate resources where they were needed, and the fact that we were, uh, you know, a public healthcare system, it did make that easier as soon as you start to fragment into, into different, um, different payers or different um, entities delivering care, it does make it harder to coordinate. So I think in an emergency like this, it was beneficial in many ways to, to have a, a public system. So I'll, I'll finish with that. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Monica. <clears throat> um, so it has been noted, I, I will attempt to slow down, to be honest with you. I thought I was speaking slowly. So to give you an indication of how quickly I sometimes do speak. Um, so Mary Jane, uh, I want to turn to you next. Um, earlier this year, uh, in an op-ed uh, in the Chronicle Herald, you drew a distinction between public delivery of healthcare and public funding of healthcare. Um, you've noted that much of what we consider public healthcare is in fact publicly insured, uh, but delivered by private corporations, uh, including um, most family doctors and specialists. Um, why do you think this distinction between public delivery and public funding is important and worth talking about? Well, thanks for the opportunity to be here. And I, I will say unequivocally to begin, which is how I will unequivocally end, defending the publicly funded, comprehensive, portable healthcare system that we have come to protect and enjoy in this country is something that I will defend to my dying breath. I got to tell you, though, it is feeling 
vulnerable now, but for reasons that are bigger than nuance. And one of the one of the things that I really wanted to clarify in today's conversation, and I think we need to be clear about in the, in the broader dialogue, is that difference between privatization and private sector delivery of healthcare, because those are two different things. And, and it, it isn't just nuanced to point out, as you say, that every physician is actually incorporated as a private ink because they are, they're not government employees, they are private businesses and they are um, professionals from whom services are purchased on our behalf as patients by government as the insurer. So I think we need to be thinking about this in the context of the publicly funded healthcare system being a big insurance cooperative of sorts. It doesn't, doesn't really follow any of the rules of insurance really, but in, insofar as we don't do much to manage risk, but, um, but we need to be thinking of the public private discussion as who is the payer. And I think that where it becomes really scary is if we move into a system where we have government as the payer for some things that would be expected as part of the publicly insured system and patients being expected or given the option to go to the market and buy things that should be in that publicly funded system. That's where it becomes highly problematic. But it's really important to me to have that distinction between privatization and private delivery of healthcare. I think those are two different things. Final thing I'll say before uh, handing it back is um, if you're in Nova Scotia today, we have, you've just seen the um, tabling of a budget that brings another $413 million to the healthcare system. And I pointed out on the radio this morning when I came to Nova Scotia, that would have been nearly half the budget for the entire healthcare system. So if we're concerned about talking about how to deal with broader issues than just sickness care, and we want to be able to tackle other social issues that have a profound impact on health, um, we are going to need to be realistic about how much of a health care of a provincial budget we can tolerate being subsumed by sickness care and talk about resetting that balance because that balance is being tipped away from social determinants of health that are going to suffer um, if we don't get the containment of sickness care services in hand. Thanks, Mary Jane. Uh, so I, I wanna to turn to Christine next. So Christine, um, when people talk about privatization, the first thing that springs to mind often is primary care and surgical clinics where the patient pays out of pocket for services. And to some degree that is uh, what Mary Jane has, uh, has identified as privatization versus um, uh, publicly paid for but privately delivered services. Um, but those sorts of primary care and surgical clinics are a fairly small part of uh, both in some ways, part of the healthcare system, a fairly small part of those parts that have been um, you know, delivered privately or owned privately. Uh, and indeed, uh, I guess one question I, I would ask is simply, uh, what other forms um, do privatization take? Sure, thanks, Chris. I mean, I, I think there are um, four or five ways of thinking about the impact of privatization and what privatization means. You know, when you consider um, public delivery, public financing, or sorry, delivery financing, um, for sure. And then when you think about also methods, so here I'm thinking about the ways that we have reformed healthcare under kind of the neoliberalism and incorporated, um, you know, economic ways of thinking about healthcare and moved away from thinking about care as relationship. But how does it fit into counting things versus really thinking about what is the core of care? And then I'd say, and we could even talk about how we've downloaded so much care onto, of course, care work that's been downloaded onto private individuals and private families, and that's a form of privatization. The one that actually comes to mind for me that I think really illustrates why privatization in terms of 
having for profit, um, having profit maximizers in our healthcare system in any form is actually P3, so public private partnerships, which I know a little bit about having written a few reports on um, in terms of schools and have published a number of reports on others, including the one on the QE um, Health Sciences Center expansion, replacement, whatever we're calling that, which is uh, P3. So you have profit maximizers, and I'm using that specifically because that is their goal. They are businesses who are looking to maximize their profit, and how do they do that, and what does that mean for our healthcare system? It means we waste a lot of money subsidizing profiteers. It means we introduce risk into our healthcare system unnecessarily, and we can get into what the justifications are for that. But absolutely unnecessarily. I mean, the evidence around P3s is that they cost way more uh, because, you know, we have a government that doesn't operate as a household that's able to borrow at lower rates than profiteers, um, private businesses, and even just on the QE2. I mean, it's, we calculated 125% more just on the financing for that pro project, which comes out to 700 million. So that, you know, alone would cover that increase that we saw this year. Um, but also, you, again, you mentioned the United States, like we need only look to a government where 20% of their GDP is spent on healthcare. And it's certainly not associated with, you know, improved outcomes or anything. And we know um, that other countries, including our own, only spend nine to 11% of their GDP. And that that same country, uh, be, really, it's about administration waste. And I'll say that part of the P3 partnerships and part of bringing profiteers in is introducing another layer of bureaucracy, another layer of contractors who we now have to deal with. And in the United States, I mean, the health insurance industry, of course, is the biggest. In fact, I, I heard and read that there are more workers in the insurance industry in the United States than there are frontline healthcare workers. Uh, our healthcare system is very efficient. Administrative costs are only about 2.9% in Canada. It's quite, quite astounding to see the difference. And then we and we can talk more about why, but then we move into this place where we bring in uh, private for profit and we risk so much, especially because they use things like uh, they can't tell us really what's in the contracts because, you know, that would be commercial secret. Uh, so there's a lack of transparency. It really gets at the heart of what I think we need to be thinking about in terms of healthcare and 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 making it more responsive and more expansive is who's involved in those decision makings. And that's exactly the wrong way to go. We lose control um, when we introduce those P3 contracts, but, but just private for profit as well. We lose some of the oversight and capacity to hold our government to account for public decisions. Um, and again, it, you know, we're locking into these contracts for 30 years. Like wh where will we be in 2052 and what will things be like? I think I'll end there, Chris. And great, so uh, thank you, Christine. And I do wonder, I believe Monica may have jumped off um, and I said she had many other jobs. She is uh, on call for public health right now as well. So, um, I guess like uh, I'll re-ask the question um, if and when she she returns in time. Um, but I guess I wanted to uh, to ask a question actually from the audience that I think uh, fits in here. And I'd like to sort of, I think, dive into this distinction that uh, Mary Jane has brought up and that uh, I think all three panelists probably have much to say about. So Norma Jean Prophet asks, uh, Prophet being a suitable name, I suppose, in this case, um, asks if there's really much of a difference between privatization and the delivery of uh, government funded healthcare through private companies. Both are profit making and their first priority is profit, not people. Um, so I do wonder, Mary Jane, um, if you can address that very real concern about um, what happens when uh, privatization is sort of the central driving <coughs> reason why a uh, provider may be um, delivering care. Uh, and do you have any concerns about that? Thanks. Sorry. I'm toggling some dogs that are becoming a little bit animated. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, so um, 
to answer that question, I just I, I need to categorically agree with the concern around P3. And, I'm so sorry. The um, the issues uh, the issues that have been raised with regard to the lack of accountability and transparency, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm not even saying, I'm not even saying but um, but what I would suggest. What I would suggest is that we need to hang on one sec, one one moment. All right, I don't seem to even control my mute button anymore. Um, but I do, I, I do think that the issue of transparency and accountability is even lacking in the publicly funded system. I mean, there is no statement of performance expectations that exists between government and the Nova Scotia Health Authority that I could find. I have no idea what the real accountability and performance framework is because we have no standards for the system. So, so sorry, in the same way, one minute. All right, we're going to try this. In, in the same way as one of the concerns that has been expressed around the other private relationship is with the delivery of ambulance services, it's difficult to pin anyone to explain what the standards are on something as fundamental as response times, um, because you can't really get a straight answer out of the contractor, and there doesn't appear to be any sense of the need for great accountability on on government's part in purchasing these services. So I would say that accountability and transparency and standards is something that we need to hold the publicly funded system um, feet against the fire, um, agreeing absolutely that we lose that entirely when we're in a game that somebody is, uh, is in the relationship purely for profit. But standards and accountability is something that's a problem throughout the system that we really need to be honest about, I think. I guess a, a question I have for um, all three, or at least two of you until Monica is available, is um, is why is it that um, we can't, is there institute those requirements within um, the public sector? Uh, those requirements, um, when, they're, when we try to institute these sort of transparency and accountability mechanisms with private um, bidders, the reason given is often just claims simply that allowing the public to see any sort of information would violate uh, trade secrets. Uh, that's not just in healthcare, that's in all kinds of forms of contract in the private sector. Um, and and that, that's often the excuse that's given, as well as there's real challenges often with, uh, with attempts to negotiate contracts. And we actually have to often build very large bureaucracies to um, actually negotiate contracts with features. If we had to create an entire government office um, in order to actually make any attempt to, uh, to ready deal where we don't get ripped off um, when it comes to P3s, for example, but I'm wondering, um, Christine, or uh, first, and then maybe if uh, Mary Jane or Monica want to interject as well, like, what is it that we can do in the public sector that could actually like, improve performance in healthcare, um, and in particularly on the side of sort of transparency and goal setting, but also um, just in general, what, why is it that we don't simply do more of that in the public sector? I don't know that I can answer exactly why we don't, but I'm certainly not here suggesting that we can't improve the public sector, but introducing uh, private businesses into public health care is not the answer to transparency. You know, it introduces other issues like the fact that a business, of course, can go bankrupt and close its doors tomorrow, and we know that's happened in P3s, um, but that could happen in any private business that's providing any service that we rely on for essential healthcare needs. You know, we have a province that got rid of community health boards. Those were important in terms of accountability and transparency, not that we couldn't improve on them and not that we can't improve on the way that our government and the way that we, the, the people who vote them in, what we hold them to account for, um, you know, whether that's in their mandate and whatever it is they say they're going to do, 
um, voting them in and out, obviously, is a way that we hold government to account. And it's not a way that we can hold any private business to account. Uh, but of course, we can improve accountability and transparency. Uh, and, and I think the other part of the story is that we often um, hear about, you know, comparing P3 to public uh, procurement or regular procurement, which often overestimates the issues or takes out of context what's happening in terms of that public procurement. And again, that comes back to what are we holding our government to account for? Um, versus what are they standing up for? Um, and that could be, you know, not wanting to show upfront, unlike they do in P3 projects where it's 30 years and there's the upfront cost, is making it so that it looks like it'll cost much less um, and not get the ire of those holding them to account for whatever. Uh, economic reasons versus the social need and universal access and equality that we need to be talking about. And of course, um, one of the reasons that our health budget takes up so much more space is that we aren't funding social policy. It isn't one or the other. We need to fund the other. And eventually, hopefully, we would then see the savings because we know if we get at that. Those are the kinds of things I think we do need to make sure are in the business plans of the ministers that we hold them to account for that there is more. Um, obviously, the Canada Health Act is a, is a critical piece of that. And, and when the federal government uses its spending power, it can hold our provincial governments to account as well. I don't know, Mary Jean or Monica, if either you want to chime in on that as well. Um, I can jump in and also just to apologize, I had warned, warned Chris I'm on call and there might be one call, so I did miss about five minutes as I, as I took that call, but um, I think I've caught up to, to where you are now. Um, I was thinking about what, what MJ had talked about earlier around the distinction between financing and delivery, and I do think that's a, a really important distinction. And, you know, we could either talk about public financing of private delivery. And I liked how Christine talked about it around it being in terms of corporations and investor owned for-profit corporations. I think that's often a key piece of it because even if we do talk about say physicians being incorporated and not all are, I'm, I'm not incorporated. Um, it is a different type of model than a for-profit investor owned corporation that may be delivering services in a setting where you, know, you do have a, a loyalty to your shareholders and to bring a profit to your shareholders. I think we could argue about the um, you know, model around physicians, how they get paid. I think there's lots to be said around there, but I think just, I, I, I do think about that um, somewhat differently. But in any model, I think, I don't kind of usually start out saying that model is wrong. I try to think about, you know, what are the criteria I'd want that model to meet? And if it can meet all those criteria, then okay, let's, it might be something that's worth considering. So I think the transparency piece is key, which you often don't get with, um, you know, for-profit investor owned corporations. Is it equitable? Again, there is often a, a significant um, difference in access for people to be able to access those services. Is it integrated, which, People might not think about that much, but a, a significant issue is often when your systems are separate and you know there's not the say sharing of health information between you know a patient of mine who goes somewhere and then comes to me and tells me that you know they told me X, Y, and Z, and I have no record of that. I don't have the lab information. I don't have the, the data. So I think I think all of those pieces, if a for-profit investor owned corporation can meet those, then you know, maybe it is something to consider, but for the most part, they don't meet those criteria. And so that's when we come back to how do we ensure that we are giving good services within our, our publicly funded, publicly delivered system. Um, and just to echo what Christine said about uh, the fact that Canada is often quite different from other countries that have both lower kind of overall per capita healthcare costs partly, often largely because they have put so much investment in their, into their social programs. And it isn't an either or, but when you are investing that much in preventing um, people from becoming ill, it is going to have an impact on decreasing healthcare costs. Well, 
Monica, as usual, is as brilliant as usual because she's brought us, I think, back to that need to have that clarity of criteria for a good decision-making framework that is in itself transparent. And I think that that is what we have, what we're lacking, um, that rational framework. And I would point out that even even looking to the Canada Health Act as the protector of all that's right and good um, has its own vulnerabilities because I would also kind of put the question out there, what exactly is the publicly funded healthcare system? According to the Canada Health Act, it's what's medically necessary and provided in hospitals. So um, if, you know, if we are going to have the fulsome conversation and apply the kind of appropriate criteria that Monica suggests, then I would argue that now is the time to talk about the full meal deal and talk about why dental care isn't part of the public funded system, why home care is a hodgepodge across the country, why long-term care, which was the spotlight of COVID in terms of the fracture of the um, inability of the uh, healthcare system to respond uh, in the pandemic. Um, why um, prescription drugs are not part of the publicly funded system. And, but I, I would say that we need to have that conversation in the context of those um, criteria for the business planning behind the delivery of publicly insured services. And I, and, and I would say, and I will probably get into big trouble for saying this tonight, but I would say that if all that criteria is met and if government can source the same standard at a better price than what government itself can deliver in, in a health service, then there is an obligation to the owners of the cooperative, which is us as the taxpayers, to, uh, to get the best price. But, and this is why I, I was really clear in my opening remark about being a defender of the publicly funded system, that can only occur if there is very, very clear standards of performance and delivery and transparency in terms of where the delivery is being sourced from. But I, but I, think, that, I think there can be multiple sources of delivery in that context. Uh, Mary Jane, I, I do wonder, I do kind of want to um, dive in a bit more on uh, on whether or not you actually see um, that, whether or not you believe that pri uh, private delivery um, itself actually gets in the way of some of those things, like if it is intrinsically um, incompatible with um, things like transparency and quality, uh, delivery of quality care. One example I think I, I would use is like in some ways, the, the best example of this sort of um, view of seeing it as an insurance cooperative that buys um, services at the, the cheapest possible price, or the, as you said, the best possible price. The best example in Nova Scotia in a lot of ways is our long-term care system of that model, right? In the sense that it's a system that has some public delivery, but it is, um, the vast majority of it is privately delivered through um, a combination of some not-for-profit um, private and then some for-profit private. And I think one of the things we actually saw during COVID was a real challenge of the coordination piece that Monica put, uh, described that was actually sort of built into having a system that has all of these different uh, providers, where, for example, during COVID, we weren't able to get um, provincially uh, numbers on something as simple as vaccination rates among staff um, during COVID. There's been huge complaints about uh, an unfair uh, level of access to um, services within these facilities during COVID and different levels of adhering to COVID rules. Um, there was a case that was reported in the Halifax Examiner where a long-term care facility temporarily shut down and uh, one of the, the patients in this for-profit facility was moved to another facility. Um, it was an adult with um, uh, cognitive impairments and that man's family spent months trying to find their loved one simply because no one in the system could tell them where it is. So in some ways, when I hear Monica describing uh, the challenges that this sort of patchwork of, uh, of for-profit has in terms of, um, of coordination, and then I hear you describing the healthcare system as an insurance cooperative, um, I, see, I see a 
something that looks to me like something that actually prevents the kind of quality of care that you say that we should be aiming for. And I was wondering if um, you can address, I think, that question, whether or not it is compatible at all with um, privatization or, and quality care. And uh, there is as well, I will note a, um, a poll up if anyone wants to, to answer it as well. Well, I think that that compatibility is only with transparency, which is kind of therein lies the rub, right? Um, my the the hypothesis that I'm putting forward is that if we if we think of this as an insurance cooperative, and we think of the insurance cooperative being smart in the way it manages itself, seeking to get the highest quality service at the best price, which and you know, there's there's no getting around the the kind of ugly reality that the health system is is itself a business. Government is a business. It needs to exact the the highest quality to the best price. Um, then, in order to in order to source that, we need to be kind of clear on what it is that we're buying. And I, I guess I I struggle in in um, achieving clarity in my own mind that we're even clear within the five billion dollars that we're spending in healthcare now that we're really clear on what we're buying. I, I would challenge anyone to set out tonight to say what we as taxpayers, as citizens, as patients of the system actually are expecting by way of accountability of government in making this purchasing on our behalf, whether it private or public, I don't know. And that, you know, that that's that's a that's a problem. And it's a it's a problem in the context of this privatization conversation because it makes the publicly funded system and its comprehensiveness really vulnerable because it means that things happen behind the scenes services get dropped services get added without any any conversation that engages us as the members of the cooperative um and that that's the big conversation that we need to have i think in in some respects the the privatization piece is a little bit of a boogeyman right now because we haven't even really clarified what the publicly funded system is. Um, so, you know, I, I acknowledge absolutely all of the issues that have been raised with respect to P3. I acknowledge that there is clear philosophical incongruence with a for-profit motivation in the delivery of a public good. So I get all of that. I guess my appeal is that if we're really going to be honestly talking about transforming, reinventing the health system, the publicly funded healthcare system, that we get over ourselves in believing that just because it's publicly funded, it is therefore good and the best. It's not, it's broken. And its brokenness is now vulnerable to the profiteers who see the opportunity to come in and who are going to come and bite us in the bum if we don't get our house in order, and it is not in order right now. Uh, Christina or Monica, I don't know if either of you want to respond to that. Um, and, and specifically, I actually am curious if either of you have any thoughts on, uh, in particular, or anything uh, that's been said, but also I think in particular, I think the, the question uh, uh, Jane has, has framed um, healthcare as an insurance cooperative. And I do wonder if that is, um, if you think the best way to think about public healthcare, um, because I also think that she's like asked a really important question, which is even asking a question like, is that the correct way to think about public healthcare is something we often don't ask ourselves about the system at all. Um, and I, I do wonder if this, uh, this insurance cooperative model is, um, is either the best way to think about the system we have now or the system we ought to have, um, but, uh, Monica? I always get a button will pump up, pop up saying the host is unmuting you. And I feel like that's the hint to say, you should say something now. Um, like essentially that that is what we have in Canada. We have, you know, every province and territory has a, a health insurance system. So that it, it is what we have. That's the, the system that, that's been created um, in this country. I 
do agree, like, is it truly a, a system? We have, you know, coverage that you can generally count on of physician and hospital services. And as many in the audience probably know, that wasn't supposed to be the end of what would come under health. Um, it was supposed to be, you know, long-term care, pharma care, um, you know, in a range of different issues, including other types of um, health promotion supports and not just looking at, as um, Mary Jane said, at, at sickness care. And we've just never moved past that, that first stage of Medicare. So, so I agree that it, in some ways it's a system, in many ways it, it is quite fragmented given that there's so much disparity in terms of access to even within hospital and physician care, but definitely beyond those services, um, quite a lot of um, disparity. Um, again, I think we're that whole kind of uh, financing and delivery is kind of getting mixed together. So there's the, the financing piece, which either comes through, you know, public health insurance, which gets paid by government, or in like in the poll, when they were talking about, you know, private virtual care and other pieces where people are paying out of pocket or through private insurance. And I think that is quite problematic because that clear that creates a clear inequity in terms of access. So if, for people who can pay for insurance or pay out of pocket, they will be able to access care ahead of others who are within the public insurance system. Um, so I agree that it's an insurance system. I think the the, the delivery piece of it, I, like I was saying, you know, it, it is very hard for these private for-profit investor-owned corporations to show that they are meeting the kind of criteria, especially equi equi equitability, equity, as well as um, you know transparency and integration. I think it is often, I, it, it's rare that that actually happens. So even in models where we're seeing a lot of provinces for short-term needs contract to uh, for-profit surgery corporations, I don't think that should be our long-term strategy. Maybe it will help in a very short term to get through a, a crisis, but um, it's you know physicians and nurses and housekeeping and the many other people who make up healthcare that could be part of an integrated public system. Um, but yeah, I think a challenge comes up because people who are trying to increase the profit side of healthcare, you know, they are often far ahead in terms of setting up these corporations and systems. Um, and the public system and government is not quite ready to kind of deal with them and figure out how to, to create a more cohesive system. And I don't know if you have thoughts on that or. I'm not sure where we are in the questions, but I, you know, I, I keep thinking about all of the research on why so many governments are contracting back in, why so many governments are, you know, really looking at all the services that they have privatized and saying, wait a minute, we're not saving money. Um, those are not good quality services. Those are the two main reasons that we're seeing services contracted back in or however you want to call that, nationalized, provincialized. Uh, and I think we need to look at that evidence quite closely and ask ourselves why we would ever go down further down this road in healthcare. I mean, I think we do have to talk about the problems in our public health care system, including uh, fee for service. Uh, it's not that it's profit maximizing, but it's a problematic way to provide care. Uh, and so there's lots that we could be looking at. If we were to take that view of cost savings, we know that a national pharmacare program would save us half of what we're all paying. And I think we have to talk about we are all paying. It's all of us, whether it's coming out of our pocket, whether it's through private insurance, taxpayer money, um, it's, it's all of us together collectively paying. And how do we pay for that more efficiently? Uh, we make sure that we actually expand public health care, that we include the National Pharma Care Program, and we can do more here, that we include dental care. We know the impact that not having those covered by our public health care system is having. It's having an impact on our public health care system. When people don't get dental access 
they are in our emergency rooms. We have to be connecting those dots and, and really, yes, addressing the public health care system by expanding it, by investing in it, and then by fixing some of the issues that are coming up. You know, one of, I think it's funny that I didn't mention that my PhD dissertation was on healthcare reform. <laughs> and um, a, a critical part of my conclusions was that we need to, and I think I said this, is we need to get back to this care being center part of our public health care system. Yes, of course, it's about equity and it's about access, but it's about relationships. And we've come so far from that, from contracting out uh, cleaners to thinking that that is not something that's a central part of our public health care system. My dissertation was about who we consider to be experts on health care and who government consults and who doesn't and who doesn't have input and who should. And I looked in particular at nurses who, in trying to become the rational actors, actually tried to present themselves not in the caring profession way, but in a way that they could kind of rationalize. And where did we go with that? We now count 4.1 hours. We, you know, we don't think about the relationships that need to be built and how we build a system around that. And that's not fee for service. Um, it's a public health care system that is integrated, that is com comprehensive, and that is properly funded by those who have the ability to pay. I do want to touch on something that I know Monica has things to say about, and I think that both Christine and Mary Jane have brought up a number of times. Um, and that's sort of questions around uh, the rest of the, what we used to call the Canadian welfare state and, and the social determinants of health. Um, so many of the health problems you know, that people face are not the result of a lack of health care per se, um, so much as they're the result of what experts call the social determinants of health. That is to say, the social and economic factors that make people more likely to become sick or injured in the first place. And those are things like poverty, structural racism, a lack of proper housing, colonialism, geography, isolation, uh, and an inability to access uh, other social services that they need. So one thing I'm always frustrated by is when I hear people say things like, we spend too much on healthcare. And my response is always just sort of like, well, that's in large part because we stopped spending money on everything else. Um, and since the early 1990s in particular, we've decimated uh, what was left of the Canadian welfare state to the point where healthcare and education are in some ways the only public services uh, that receive significant public funding and they represent a huge expenditure of public funding. But they've also become sort of the last stop gap um, where all of society's other problems are dumped on teachers, on nurses, on emergency rooms, on family doctors, on walk-in clinics. Um, and we ask that these systems to sort of absorb all the problems created by uh, the underfunding of other uh, services that we used to fund like public housing, community economic development, and social assistance. Um, sorry, I accidentally clicked the wrong button there. Um, so my question is, to what degree are the problems in the public health care system uh, the result not just of the privatization of public health care, but of the privatization um, and cuts to things that used to be publicly funded, like housing and transportation? Uh, can improvements to other social programs help improve uh, health care in this country? Because I, I do think when we talk about privatization, thinking about the privatization of housing is a good example of that is the move from a time where we used to build large swaths of co-op housing, where we built after the war um, large amounts of public housing. And the fact that, that is now seen entirely as, uh, even when the government puts money into it, it's seen as an individual responsibility that's up to these sorts of uh, interactions in the market between those who own the houses and those who wish to purchase them. So, so to what degree do we actually think that um, we can, or what, what degree and what problems within the public health care system can be solved by reinvesting in other public goods. I don't know if uh, any of you want to chime in. I've asked all of you to unmute, so whoever gets in there first. Oh, oh Monica, do you want to go? <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like that's a great Christine question to get into the economics of it. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I, I was going to say, of course, we've costed poverty um, in our province, and, and I'll be clear that the cost of poverty doesn't actually include income assistance, and we could talk about that, but it's actually based on the research and the evidence around the impact of the social determinants of health, which can be anywhere from 30 to 50 percent. Uh, determining health outcomes and and what we learned was that it costs about two billion dollars just to support people to 
manage to live in poverty. That's all our government does. Well below any poverty line, those who have to rely on government as last resort are, are thousands of dollars below the poverty line. So just to help people manage to live in poverty costs us. It costs us in terms of additional health care costs. Again, it, I think our number was somewhere around 300 million a year here in Nova Scotia in additional costs. And of course, that's not that that has to do with understanding um, how our system um, is, you know, not responsive to those in low income. And that's not to say I'm talking about the public system itself, not those who can't get access to private health insurance, but those who don't have the paid sick leave, who can't take time off, who can't get to the appointment that they might have finally gotten, who, you know, delay uh, seeking treatment because they, again, can't take time off work. All of the things that happen when you are struggling or because your experience with healthcare, if you are somebody who is an African Nova Scotian or somebody who has been faced racism or faced other kinds of treatment in the healthcare system, then you're not you know, accessing the care you need. And so we, we do need to be thinking about how do we get at the root causes of health disparities? How do we, and that is so critical, if we start to, you know, the whole thing about let's intervene first, if we, the earlier we invest, the greater the return on investment. The investment in childcare that we're seeing is so important. We have 40,000 kids who live in poverty in our province. We absolutely need to be investing in the social determinants of health from the housing that you talk about, nonprofit housing, permanent cooperative housing, permanent affordable housing, uh, quality housing and in the income assistance programs and in the other ways that we need to be supporting through our social policies that our governments really have not been doing um, because we've been really leaving people to, you know, pull up their bootstraps, as we say. I think I'll leave it there. I won't take any time other than to say I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you can't separate these issues out, which is why we need to be taking a holistic approach to not just the health care spending, but what, what is the broader investment in a healthy province. And I mean, as we all know, I, I know I'm preaching converted with, uh, with regard to how Nova Scotia lags on so many markers um, on that front. And, and you know, we're not going to come out of COVID any better. In fact, some of the evidence, and Monica will know this probably better than any of us, some of the evidence um, about the particularly acute impact on the most vulnerable uh, in terms of health status, burden of illness, delayed care, all those things coming out of those two years of pandemic is really terrifying. So we have a tsunami of need, of unmet need, on top of backlogs, which again, stresses the urgency for us to be talking about this holistically, not program by program, not you know, 10 million for mental health and um, 17 million for, for nursing education, but everything in totality and talking about what is the system that we are, what's the system that we're showing up? I, I also agree with what, I both have said, but with Christine's reports, that's what I tend to go to when I'm looking at from a public health perspective, what are some of the, the policies that we need to be looking at? Because although people often know public health, especially now in terms of you know, dealing with COVID and outbreak management, you know, the ideal of public health is when we are working on policies that improve the health of, of populations. Um, and I think really thinking about how policies, whether they're environmental, economic, social, healthcare, they can actually do harm to people's health if we do not think about it. So for example, thinking about how you know, income supports came out during the pandemic, and if you made less than a certain amount the year before, you wouldn't be eligible for it. So with that, we are you know, punishing people who have little to no income or may not have that income recorded for a whole range of reasons you know maybe that person might be a sex worker they might be in another uh, profession where they do not have that income we are then um, 
you know, saying your health is going to get worse because we are not going to give you this this income support. So I think recognizing that every policy has a has a health implication to it, I think would would be quite helpful. And some places have done that in a in a very kind of organized way, uh, not so much in, in Nova Scotia. And I think a challenge right now is because yes, there are many healthcare needs, and the government currently is very focused on on healthcare and you know is is putting in some um, investments into that, but I think we're losing the fact that healthcare is, is health is much more than, than healthcare. And I really need think that needs to come back into the conversation. Thank you uh, for all of you for that. And I, I'm gonna ask one more question from, uh, that we got from the audience. And one thing I would urge people to do as well, folks who are watching is um, there's a really good conversation that's happening in text in the chat. And I would encourage people to uh, to read that along as well. I think there's a lot of good comments there. I do apologize that we can't get to all of them. So um, one issue that we haven't really talked about, and there's a couple questions about this, is the question of staffing, um, which I think is sort of the elephant in the room when it comes to uh, healthcare in this province, public, private, any form of it is going to rely on staffing. Um, and so. Uh, Jason McDonald asks a question, but a few other people ask similar versions, but I'll, I'll read his, which is, um, can you tell us exactly how sending patients to private clinics is not going to affect the nursing staff shortage we already face? Uh, by sending patients to these clinics, they will need the staff to accommodate the uptake in patients. Um, so I do wonder if um, any of the uh, participants have, have thoughts on um, what the impact of uh, private clinics and contracting out um, would actually be on, on the staffing question. Well, I, I can speak to that very, very practically. Um, and it's an observation I've made many times, which is there's only one pool of healthcare providers to uh, deliver service in either system. So obviously, um, if, if there are parallel systems in track and you have the public system and the private system competing for the same people, um, something's got to give when neither system has enough people. And we know that there is a shrinking workforce with growing, uh, growing demand. So math, math is, is very problematic in, in that scenario. Um, the, and uh, based on any research that I have done of the impact of having a jurisdiction that has two systems running in parallel, the private system tends to win out over time and starve out the public system because the private system keeps the easy stuff and the public system keeps the hard stuff and the public system becomes more and more expensive and the private system becomes more and more profitable. That's, that's the trajectory that has been painted everywhere. I, um, I wonder if in you know, talking about a reinvention for us, if there is a way for us to think through how to tame that beast. And I'm not suggesting this evening that there necessarily is, but I do think there is the need to explore if it could be. Because the flip side to that is that we know just looking at it from, from kind of a, um, an organizational design perspective, the things that the publicly funded system does really well is much of that complex, um, difficult, time-consuming stuff that there is no profit in at all. Um, and some of the things that the private system does really well is the quick and easy stuff. And they can do that quickly and efficiently and at very high standards. So is there a way that we can get the best of both? And again, I'm, I'm not this evening in a position to say that there is, but I do think in the spirit of looking at all possible options and how to fix a broken system beyond just getting out of the pandemic. And I guess that's, that's the last thing that I will say. I'm really, really worried that there is a kind of 24, 36 month horizon that people are thinking about that if we just get through the bubble of everything that we need to deal with from the pandemic and we do things differently in that bubble that we will have resolved issues, we won't. All that we will have done is make everything more expensive. Now is the time for us to actually think about what we need beyond, beyond COVID and beyond uh, recovery from a pandemic. 
and um, in that context, I just, I think there are some new conversations we need to have. Um, Can I go, go, Chris? Well, oh. <laughs> Sorry, Monica. Um, I, I would agree with where MJ started out around describing what happens when we have parallel systems and we only have, of course, one workforce. And I'm thinking about what we do about that one workforce. So we have shortages of some of the, the workforce for sure. And, you know, there's a little bit of money, but there's no magic in creating a nursing seat. It will take a while for us to have more trained professionals. And of course we have to be retaining the ones that we have, or at least trying harder to do that. But I'm thinking about the things that actually do work. So we're talking about a broken system, but you know, I do have a family physician. I know I'm lucky to have one, but I do have one who's amazing, who's supported me through the through all of the things um, where I don't have to take out my credit card or talk about private insurance, but also things like the North End Community Health Center. I'm here in the North End of Halifax. Um, that, that the community-based, team-based system where we're integrating other healthcare workers has to be part of that solution. We you know, it, it doesn't have to be a physician every time. Uh, what, ab I, what about midwives? Uh, what about uh, other practitioners who can be integrated into the team? And we see that at the healthcare center. In fact, it's a healthcare center that has a mobile outreach street health team that, you know, I I'm, can remember when we were talking about primary health care, about people accessing the most appropriate care provider as close to home as possible. I can't remember what that tagline is, MJ. I'm sure you can remember that we repeated over and over for 20 years. I mean, I think that is the solution and it's team-based. And at the community health center level, you know, there's a, there is a board, there is a ability to, to have influence, to have community input, to be responsive to your neighbors. That's where you're situated. And that's the model I think we need to be growing. Um, and that is different than the collaborative healthcare models, which to me look more like emergency hospitals, maybe diagnostics. Um, and let's, let's really build that up. And, and involve community in that way, involve our providers in that way and, and build those teams out. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm actually gonna have to bring us to uh, sort of final thoughts. Um, so I would just ask, um, we'll start with Monica since she uh, didn't get a chance to respond there. I do wonder if presenters could provide some, I guess, some final thoughts. And one thing that I think I might particularly ask people to, to think about addressing um, is sort of what Christine talked about, but I think uh, both Monica and Mary Jane asked, and we have a number of questions, specifically I'm looking at one from Sue Bookchin um, on this issue, which is the question of what is it that we can do in the public system to actually um, make things better? I think that we do have to be realistic about the fact that um, no one believes that our current system is perfect. I think it's far from universal in what it is, but in terms of expansion or concrete improvements in how we deliver healthcare, what could we do within the uh, public system that could um, make people's lives better and in some ways quell some of those concerns that people do have um, and the desire some people do have for privatization? I, I would ask people to be somewhat quick so that we can ensure that we can get everyone to uh, bed nice and, nice and thoroughly. So we'll start with you, Monica, perhaps. Um, I think sometimes, you know, people, not, not people in this audience, but I think there's this sense that there's some grand innovation that if we just could figure out what it was, you know, we could fix all these issues when truly there have been models in Canada and other places that we know work that aren't, you know, flashy and exciting, but truly make a difference. So what Christine was saying about interdisciplinary teams, like there is evidence that that truly does improve people's health and is a better way to provide primary care. And so that is the type of, of model we should be implementing. Things like 
um, centralized referral system. So again, it, it doesn't sound super exciting, but it's it's very straightforward that you refer to, you know, you've got a group of surgeons, you refer to the whole group, they figure out who has what wait list, who does, who can see this patient and what time, and they allocate right now for most specialists I refer to, I have to say, oh, what's the name of that ophthalmologist? I have no idea what their wait time is. And I send off this, this letter as opposed to a centralized intake. And Nova Scotia has actually done that for some of their services and have been able to you know, decrease surgical wait time. So again, it's something that's, that's fairly kind of a straightforward concept. It's like if you went to a grocery store and you're trying to figure out what line to go to, but you can't actually see the lines and then you just have to pick where to go it, it just doesn't make sense um, there's other models again around team-based care that if you're referring people for you know hip surgery if you have a physiotherapist on that team that can help support the patient they may not actually need that hip surgery in the end and may do much better with physiotherapy but like physiotherapy is often really hard to to access so i think we have lots of ways we know the system could be improved um, and it's just we have you know multiple systems across the country and pilot projects in different places that don't get expanded um, and just to say again I think that that um, social and economic supports that they just need to be they need to be the underpinning of health and then healthcare is is a support for for that and we really need to look at like what is the you know, minimal amount of, of income that people, not even minimal, to, to thrive. It's not even just to get by, not to survive. Like if we could do something like that, um, to be able to ensure an, an adequate amount of, of money to pay for your daily needs and have a, a decent life, that would do far more for health than many of the healthcare interventions. Recognize at the same time, we, we want to have healthcare there when we need it. And I think that is that is still essential. Uh, Mary Jane, I don't know if you have uh, sort of concluding thoughts, including this question about um, fixes are within the system or improvements within the public realm. Yeah, well, I think that uh, to agree with what Monica said and add to it, I would say that what we really need in the system now is some real clarity around standards and accountability so that as the people who are paying for this healthcare system, we understand what exactly we are holding government to account to ensure is available, um, and uh, to understand how we would assess the performance of the healthcare system, because that now is as clear as fog, and that's highly problematic. I would also say that the time has come for us as a country to revisit what we actually mean by a Canadian healthcare system and that we look at consistency across the country and that we look at a, um, a comprehensiveness that presently does not exist. So I believe that to stave off privatization, we actually need to build up the publicly funded system. And that means that we need dental care, we need long-term care to be in the system, we need pharma care to be in the system, we need, we need to be covered top to toe, uh, uh, cradle to brave, and a little bit on either end. Um, and the, because today we don't actually have a healthcare system. We have a network of a patchwork of services, which are performing well for some people, not well for others. And um, we could do, we could do a lot better, but it has to be, a, a, it has to be a national conversation. Uh, thank you, Mary Jane. I, I will just uh, quickly indulge in myself, uh, myself and my organization point to the fact that the Nova Scotia Health Coalition has consistently, as well as a number of organizations, have consistently called for an expansion of the system. And I, I hope to get a bit more to, into that in this discussion than we had. But um, particularly in the question of pharmacare, I would um, yeah, I would just point people in the direction if you're interested both in the Health Coalition's website, but also I have a piece forthcoming in the uh, Independent, uh, Newfoundland newspaper, as well as um, a number of podcast episodes I'm guesting on, including um, the progress report out of uh, Progress Alberta. So I, I think there is a lot of discussion of pharmacare, and I think now is in a lot of time ways the time to strike on that. Where we have perhaps have more momentum now than we've ever had, uh, really since um, the birth of Medicare. Um, that said, Christine, I'm wondering if you can uh, chime in with some thoughts on repairs to the healthcare system or social services in general, which will also sort of be a, a, the last comments and sort of the discussion we've had tonight. 
I mean, I, I would certainly echo that, it, 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 you know, part of the answer, obviously, or the answer is around healthcare is that it, it not, needs to be comprehensive since when don't eyes and teeth and all of uh, parts of our body and our mental health. I mean, that's all critical and we need it to be covered. Um, but I am thinking more broadly, even more broadly than the social determinants of health and thinking about community well-being and, and why we you know, need to be connecting the dots around what it means to build healthy communities. You know, we can no longer and no longer should be talking about growing our economy without talking about who gets part of that growth. We should be talking about why democracy is helps us in terms of a healthy community well-being. People need more input, meaningful input into the, the decisions, including in healthcare. You know, I was thinking about uh, when things were so awful in long term care and at our peril, didn't listen to the unions, didn't listen to the frontline workers, uh, didn't listen to the families. We need meaningful opportunities for input, and we've seen those meaningful opportunities become fewer and fewer with you know, certain people having the ear of government and others certainly not. Um, and I think that, you know, that's part of the, where we need to go in building this healthcare system. It needs to be responsive to our needs, to the needs of the workers, to the needs of those who they're providing services to. And unless there are opportunities for us to provide that input, we're never gonna get there. Um, and so I think I'll, I'll end there. Thanks so much. Perfect. Thank you so much um, to all three of our participants for it. Um, I, I really appreciate the fact that I think we had a conversation that I think let us dig in a bit more to some of, I think, the underlying questions around these sorts of things that we normally do. I think often these conversations uh, happen very briefly um, around healthcare and uh, often are reduced to um, simpler terms than they deserve. So I want to thank the, the three of you for participating and for, I think, um, really drawing out, I think, some of the the challenges we face in the healthcare system. And I don't think um, we have any sort of super definitive answers coming out of this, but I, uh, I think that's a sign of a good conversation um, is that um, I think we're, we're left with a, a lot to think about. And um, I also wanna thank as well, um, the audience. Um, I do wanna apologize that we were not able to get to all of the very good questions we received. We tried to sort of combine some of as many of them as possible. Um, there were some great conversations and I would also urge folks again, uh, before we close this, to take a look at some of the comments that were made in the chat. I think there's a lot of good information and a lot of good points and thoughts in there. Um, that said, um, I also just want to uh, turn it over to Dee Dee Sly, who is from the Council of Canadians HRM chapter, who's going to uh, leave us with um, some parting remarks and some information, including uh, how we can take some actions on some of the things that we talked about tonight. Thank you, Chris. You're an amazing moderator and everybody was just so interesting and so much information. I really, really appreciate that. I'm, uh, uh, it's been a wonderful evening. I'm Didi Sly. I'm a co-chair of the HRM chapter of the Council of Canadians, as well as a member of the National Board of the Council of Canadians. I hope you've enjoyed the panel tonight, everybody. The Council of Canadians is a national organization with chapters across the country. We're active in a number of areas, including climate action, water protection, trade, and protecting extending public health care. So um, we, we co kind of, uh, it was a a bunch, I was like all of our four um, Nova Scotia chapters that thought it, that it was time to have this discussion. We're hearing from people that uh, they're, you know, that we're hearing this kind of noise that it's time to look at public at the at the healthcare system. And we think that that we thought that the opportunity is ripe for privatization. So really, thank you for all joining us here today to talk about this. Um, we are, we have four chapters we have that are co-hosting the South Shore, the North Shore, Cape Breton West and HRM. So thank you to everybody involved. Thank you to our support team, including Angela Giles for being such an amazing organizer and helping to make this happen this evening. In terms of next steps, we've created a letter, uh, on the council, 
on the council website that we're asking everybody to take a moment to sign, reminding Premier Houston and the Minister of Health and Wellness, Michelle Thompson, that profits have no place in healthcare. Um, the link is in the chat. All of the organizations that co-hosted the event this evening are member-based. So if you aren't a member of the Nova Scotia Health Coalition, the CCPA of Nova Scotia, or, um, or the Council of Canadians, please check us out and join. You can be a member of the Council for as low as $1. Um, and with your membership, you'll be able to con we'll be able to contact you about campaigns we have on the go. Angela is dropping the links uh, to all three co-host organizations in the chat. Um, and there'll be a link to more about the council if you're interested. In the coming days, we'll be sending out the links to our organizations and a recording of tonight's event to everyone who registered. So um, on behalf of the council, so there we go. She's put up the taking action. What action would you be willing to to take to push back against privatization in healthcare. So you can submit your 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 uh, your poll there. Um, I want to thank the panelists, especially to Chris for sharing uh, you know sharing your knowledge and 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 moderating this evening for 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 us in such a, a respectful, kind and um, knowledgeable way. Together, we can continue to fight for the public good over private interests. And I think we can all be together on that. And uh, thank you all for being here. And I guess back to Chris for a good night. Uh, yeah, so we'll just say good night to that. And I would say um, a reminder that uh, there you will receive an email um, that will have a recording this uh, talk, a link to that as well as um, uh, information on how to take action and links to the, the various organizations. So uh, thanks so much for everyone for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.